Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is Willem van der Horst, your host for the show. All right, so let's see. I don't have all that much to say, but I did. I did actually. T- I mean, I'm lying. I typed a few things down. <laughs> I say that I'm like, no, I don't have anything to say for the intro. But there's always a few things to say. I'm always between. Like, how much rambling do you want to hear? How much rambling do I want to speak? Regardless of how much you want to hear. Anyhow, uh, just the main broad news is that it's springtime in Chicago. I mean, it's springtime in all of the northern hemisphere, arguably. Yes. But the you know the weather's nice. The birds are chirping. It's a nice breeze. Sun beginning to, beginning to warm things up. There's the boats are coming out in the harbor. I live very close to the harbor of the um, of Lake Michigan. So all the boats are come starting to come out of their warehousing hibernation. Uh, I'm pretty busy with the podcast. I'm busy keeping in touch with a lot of people in the advertising and marketing industry and in the gaming industry. We're recording some conversations. There's been more uh, conversations around the strategy, creative strategy, advertising, marketing side of things than there has been on the games and play side of things. Uh, but I'm just working to ramp the balance up on the other way around. Um, I still have a bit of time for new projects. If ever you need strategy, you're looking for a freelance strategist, you need advice for whether it's your brand or your agency needs some help, uh, don't hesitate keeping in touch. Today, I have a very exciting guest. I'm super excited to be presenting, uh, well, presenting the conversation. I'm presenting, I'm introducing the conversation I had with Mark. Mark Pollard is an Australian brand strategist who's been living now in New York for nine or 10 years, long standing career working in really great marketing and advertising agencies. He writes, and of course, a lot of you listening to this will know Mark probably before me because I'm going to be posting this on one of his groups and I'm saying, but he writes a lot, talks and shares about the creative and advertising and marketing industry at large, how those strategic and creative processes work. And he shares how he works that process too. He's got a consultancy called Mighty Jungle and a group he created called Sweathead. And the, really it's a whole community. Sweathead like is sharing people, sharing with others and people sharing with other people how it is they do this job called strategy and marketing and advertising mostly, but there's a lot of other like-minded people who like thinking for a living. I met a couple of other people in Chicago who don't necessarily work in strategy, but who are interested in how does this stuff work and how can I apply it because I'm interested in creativity, I'm interested in communications, I'm interested in growing brands, and they learn a lot from that. And it's a global community by now. There's a 4,500 or more people in the Facebook group. So you can come and find out if you're just finding out about it. You can type in Sweathead. Uh, he started the Sweathead podcast in which he has a lot of conversations with people in the strategy, advertising, marketing, communication communities. Um, and uh, there's like, uh, from the latest, he said a, a month or two ago, over a thousand, a hundred thousand people listening or downloading the podcast or episodes downloaded over time. He's got nearly, if not probably more than 100 episodes uh, because he's been pretty prolific on producing it, uh, way more than I have anyway. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 by the way, I've been meeting some people from the Sweathead community in Chicago. So if ever you're listening to this and you're in Chicago, don't hesitate reaching out to me. I'm always happy to meet like-minded people, coffee, drinks. I'm thinking about organizing a drinks meetup for people in strategy, advertising, and marketing in a few weeks. So... I'll be giving more news about that uh, very soon. So anyway, yeah, Mark is awesome. He's very, very cool. I met him a couple of years ago in London, but we talk about that. So I don't want to go over that in any more detail. You'll see in the show just a little bit of housekeeping before we go there. Um, first, all the shameless promotion. It helps a huge amount if you spend time to just a few minutes to say the show's awesome. Please keep going to so put a rating, give a rating or a review on your podcasting app. Or on, so if you go on your laptop on iTunes and type in Ice Cream for Everyone or your Apple Podcast apps, if you have an, uh, an iPhone, uh, Stitcher is a thumbs up. Uh, Google Podcasts, I believe you can also leave a review there. Uh, you can give me a comment on the website if you're listening from there. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting app. Just like look up Ice Cream for Everyone. Because uh, I noticed I, I just changed media hosting providers and I noticed quite a lot of people listen through the website directly but yeah you can also find all the episodes on your favorite podcasting app and spotify by the way so anything spotify you can listen through that give it a rating and review uh, if you don't find where to give it a rating and review you can 
send me a tweet that is to, or share the episode with other people just so more people listen to it. That's the other reason I talk about the ratings and the reviews is it helps the kind of algorithms of wherever you're getting your podcast, the more ratings and reviews, five star please, uh, it gets, then the more other people get the show recommended to them if they listen to that, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, or send me a tweet. My Twitter handle is ICVillem. That's letter I, letter C, W I W L E M on Twitter. Uh, you can drop me an email. I'm Villem at icecreamforeveryone.net. W I W L E M at icecreamforeveryone.net. Obviously, the rest of the website, writing and stuff like that, or all the other episodes are either on your podcasting app or on the website at icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything's spelled out. Again, also reach out if you want to be a guest on the show. I'm always looking for new people. I, uh, you know, I'm a couple of conversations behind, so I'm up publishing two episodes this week. I'm still working it out with other things I'm doing at the same time. Uh, I'd love to have more feedback also on the kinds of guests I have, like who you particularly enjoy. There's a lot of, if it's the first time you're listening, there's a lot of other people I've talked to. And I tend, because of my interest in playing games, to talk to people in marketing and advertising and branding and also people in game design or people have to do with play in general. So uh, I've heard from people who work in marketing and advertising. Some people are gamers or some are really interested in hearing about game designers. Uh, I've not really heard much the other way around. So I don't know if the conversations with strategists in advertising appeal to people who are gamers in themselves. So I'm mixing up a little bit more of the conversation. For example, with Mark, we talk about creativity. We talk about his the book he's writing, Strategies, Your Words. Uh, it's going to be coming out very soon. We talk about chess and strategy and tactics at chess and a few other games. So it comes through a little bit like that. Uh, the interest in playing games is something a little bit I'm focusing on a little bit more than in previous episodes. But most of the episodes are fairly evergreen. Most of the episodes are published with other strategists or about what inspires them, their stories, etc. So you can still go back to what was, you know, what's still there from a couple of years ago. And they're generally pretty solid, I think. Uh, what else? I think, I think that's about it for now. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, just please, without any further ado, have fun and enjoy the conversation I had with Mark. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. What's up? I'm good. You start your shows with what's up, don't you? Most of the time. Oh gosh, yeah. I, it's not even a verbal tick. It's. It, I don't know why I do that. Sometimes I mix it, mix it up. You know. Is it because you're an American? You like adopted the American way? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I did. I did do hip hop radio for a long time. Now I'm nervous that it's cultural appropriation. But I. I, I don't know. Just I. You know, I'm. A, I'm a little bit monotone, and I think what's up is a way for me to try to be like an exclamation mark, an exclamation point. That's what I'm trying to do. It confused me, you know, because I was born in the States and what moved to France when I was six. And when I was a teenager, I came to visit the States and other teens were like, hey, what's up? And I, it got me really confused because I thought it was a question and it took me a while to realize it's not really a question. Yeah, you, you hear that a lot when people move around. Even even the question, how are you? Or as Aussies would say, it, hey, Gan, hey, Gan. And people are like, do you actually want to know or are you just saying it? I used to say g'day a lot during the day at work in Australia. Just pass someone in, in the hall in an agency, hey, g'day. I don't say that here. And I don't say what's up to people really in, in the face, but it's, I do it when I record. It's because I'm trying to have personality. <laughs> like you don't have that usually. Well, we all have a form of personality. Yes, <laughs> we, do. we do. I wouldn't describe mine as a rainbow. Okay. How would you describe yours then? Oh, it's pretty, it's pretty, like I said, it comes from a monotone place. It comes from this weird game that I know it's part of the Australian psyche, but growing up, it, the weird game was, I'm not going to let you know what I take seriously. Okay. I'm going to be sarcastic. And here's the deal. If you take something seriously that I don't take seriously, I'm going to let you know about it through my sarcasm, which means I win. That's a huge part of the culture that I grew up around. And is that, do you, did you, do you think it's Australian in particular or just a neighborhood or vibe or kind of group of people that you're with? Well, probably a combination of English, Irish, uh, 200 years, 300 years, at least for the people who immigrated there in a very hot country. I don't, look, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I get cool. no, I get, I get really no, like I'm so aware of how specific everyone's upbringing is that any sure. stereotypical way of looking at things is, is problematic. All right. Uh, well, I'm glad that we get to talk. This is a second attempt. Uh, and in the meantime, so yes, I saw you in London a couple of years ago and, uh, I had just gotten like a brand new recorder that I tried to use in a coffee shop and it didn't work. And, and I was just embarrassed that it didn't work properly, but it was a good time and it was a fun conversation and it was a, like, it was good to hang out over there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad we get to do this again. And in the meantime, you started your own podcast while I completely let go of mine. I mean, almost borderline and uh, like, congrats. Like you, you have a very, you've been just really serious at it. Cause when did you start? Like only not that long ago, right? Last year. Yeah. About a year ago. So maybe a year ago from this month. Yeah. Yeah. February. Maybe, and you February have March. what 75 or are you, you must be close to a hundred episodes or not too far off. I think I've recorded almost a hundred. I don't count them. Like I don't, I don't uh, number the ep episodes. I don't count them, but every now and then I'm like, how many is this? It must be near a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, that's just a, uh, a f I mean, for me, a high frequency given last year, it did five, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> which I'm very embarrassed about, but I'm getting back on track. I'm like, I'm very glad to be talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel a panic about trying to get some of these stories out. These, these conversations, the one we're having right now, this is where I feel most, al not most alive, but kind of most alive uh and so they're important for me psychologically i enjoy them i want to get other people's ideas and stories out i enjoy the banter i learn from them all you know it, there there are so many reasons to do them and the past few years as, as i've been working out how to live with with more intention i'm just trying to have this unashamed attitude which is difficult an unashamed attitude to building a life where i do what i want to do a lot of the time and while also trying to feed my family and the more i can do that that seems coherent congruent useful reasonable way to live privileged uh i know but i'm working at it i'm working at it yeah well privilege though the the thing that i find is great is uh you are putting a lot of efforts into formulating and putting um frameworks together and sharing them with the wider world so while, yes, it is privileged and it's really good to, to talk about it, the fact that you're sharing these things so that other people can get what you have, or maybe not the way of life, just certainly, but certainly all the skills that are allowing you to get there, I think. So I think that's a, I don't think that's a cool thing anyway. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I think you can psychoanalyze that kind of behavior in so many ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware of all of that. You know, you can apply evolutionary psychology to that sharing behavior where it's about status seeking survival mate finding mates which is not what i'm trying to do um getting access to resources then there's the science of altruism doing good for people where doing good for people you get a little they call it a warm glow you get a little splash of probably dopamine in the brain when you do things that are good for people it helps then on a deeper level there's just me trying to pro solve my own problems and project into the world things that I probably needed at a younger age and things that I need now. And I, like I did this writing exercise recently and it, often I sit down uh, once a month or so. I've been pretty good at this. Not, I'm not dogmatic with it. I'm not crazy about it. And I sat down. I was like, what am I trying to do? We're about to enter a new phase. Spring's coming. I'm about to finish some of my projects that I'm going to put out into the world. And immediately, like even before I'd asked the question, the word neglect popped into my head and, 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 to me, the opposite of neglect is creativity. And I think it's creativity together. You can do it by yourself, but I think together, I don't know, that's my, my thesis on life is doing creative things with other people is what life's about other than feed, you know, eating and having enough money to be able to eat and somewhere to live and shelter, et cetera. So, so I know the privilege in that, but there's a lot of dynamics that come into play with anybody who's doing this kind of stuff. Uh, it's also a way to have, have friends. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think there's, I agree. And I think there's something, well, I really, I really love having those conversations too. That's part of the reason I'll, I'll come to the, uh, to a question on that, but I was going to say, just to jump on what you're saying, the, there's enormous, there's a lot of value in working out stuff for oneself, for yourself, for me, for you, but there's, and I tend to do that, uh, but I get stuck inside my own head and there's stuff available and working things out in a dialogue that is not available. And I don't realize because I usually just try to take a step back and try to figure shit out on myself. And it doesn't really have the same amount of 
uh, opportunities, possibilities, and creativity than if I open up and talk about it with someone. Yeah, yeah, totally. And look, pe- people who do these kinds of things, they get criticized. You hear comments like, oh, I haven't heard this directly to myself. Oh, it just likes the sound of his own voice. But like, it's really loud inside my head at all times. It's difficult to turn off or modulate. And yeah, I like to get out. I like to have these conversations, but it doesn't come from a place of narcissistic egotism. Although those dynamics are always at play with anyone who does creative work or does this kind of stuff. I need to have these chats and I'm happy to put them in public and I get enough feedback that they help. Uh, and as, as you would as well. So I, I, there is a, you, like a public benefit to it that I really do believe in. Uh, and at its heart, it comes from this sense of neglect that I think a lot of people in the world have felt the statistics don't lie. You look at the statistics around perceived sense of loneliness, addiction, um, depression, so on and so forth. There's, you know, I don't know. It's not, I know it's trivial and trite to say that creativity is the opposite of those things. It's too simplistic. It's stupid. It feels like, it feels really interesting though. That is, I think it's a really interesting, well, yeah, it's an interesting take on it. And uh, uh, the question goes thinking of the earlier, and it might be just a simple answer. I don't know if it's a simple answer or not, but I took a while before figuring out what this show would be about. And I'm still, I still figured out some more stuff, even though I'm not really changing anything to the content. Um, When you, before you started the podcast, did you take a while or did it, how was it that you came to this kind of format and looking for those kinds of conversations? Well, I mean, I'm still riffing on a pretty similar idea or thesis thesis might be a grand a too grand a word but you know what i'm trying to do is give people who do similar work to us access to conversations a lot of us didn't get access to when we were in the system and that can be quite isolating if you're thinking you're trying to do good work and you happen to be working in a in an agency or a, on a project with a team or even in a city or a country that doesn't do the kind of work that you think you want to do that's really isolating and people who think too much are going to take it personally. They're going to beat themselves up. They're going to see themselves as the problem. And guess what? That helps other people. A lot of people who aren't like you want you to see yourself as a problem. And so there are these riddles. So I'm just trying to get these conversations out there. Uh, I talk in a year. I, I interact with thousands of people and I hear the stories and I hear the struggles they're going through. And I think it's useful to have some of these ideas in public so that, first of all, people don't feel alone. So the idea behind what I'm doing with the with Sweathead is to connect people who think for a living, many of whom are quite intuitive, many of whom might identify as being quite sensitive and emotional, not everyone, but many, uh, and they want to do something creative. They're trying to work out how to talk to themselves in healthier ways. And I'm just trying to create a gang around that because the power of these people and their brains, it's huge. If you can help them see through their day jobs, if they're not feeling fulfilled in their day jobs, uh, I I don't know. I just, I, I get quite emotional. It's like, if I feel the energy around it, but I'm also very aware of the psychology of why I'm doing it and the other, you know, I can break it down as well. I'm not an idiot. So, so the thesis hasn't evolved too much, you know, at, at some point I'll probably start to tweak it a bit more and get into, uh, probably in a year or two, you know, right now I want to, frank conversations and then try to work out how to help people have give people really practical ways to do their day jobs so they have good careers but to not detach that from the psychology and the culture in, of what they're doing you know i think it's too easy to go here's how to write an insight and then they're like it didn't work and then we have to talk about whether it was good objectively subjectively the culture in which they're in what's happening in their brain so i'm trying to bring all those things together and i, I think this is kind of life's work for a while Okay, so let me just just backtrack just one second. So we, we dove straight in, and we've met before, and we do the same kind of work. But uh, not everybody listening to this is necessarily a strategist, and I know that a straddle like a couple of different kinds of audiences. So, uh, and also just as an intro, in case anybody who's not heard of you, uh, do you want to just give us a, like a quick, you know, intro of like who you are and what kind of work you do, and how you describe the work that you do? Ooh, are you going to psychoanalyze how I do this? Uh, uh, I mean, not in commentary. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the CV, resume, job history stuff. I've like I, I have had some good experiences. I always I don't often find it very interesting. But the main pit stops along the way. Uh, I started in digital agencies when I was about nineteen or twenty, before the two thousand dot com crash. 
Uh, simultaneously, I would often stay back in an office before I had before I had my own computer. I think around that age, and work on a hip hop magazine. I was doing a hip hop radio show in Sydney called the Mothership Connection. It had been around for it was the longest running hip hop radio show. I took it over when I was about twenty. I was making websites at the time on GeoCities. I was promoting dance parties and and hip hop shows as well. Distributed vinyl and had this sort of hip hop. I didn't even talk about it till I was tw- like late twenties, really. But that was a separate life. The hip hop stuff. I would often sleep at agencies, not always, uh, and was also working in digital agencies as a producer. But we did the user experience, information architecture. You know, I'd do three hundred page functional specifications. Blah 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 blah. And then when I was 28, I kept doing that digital work and also added on brand strategy at Leo Burnett Sydney, a guy called Todd Sampson, who's become pretty famous down there, actually took a, took a punt on me. We had a really good crew. There was 14 or 15 planners in, at Leo Burnett Sydney. I realized that Leo Burnett Sydney now, I mean, I, knew, I sort of knew it at the time, but I have a better appreciation for it now that I've um, traveled a little bit more around the world professionally. It's consistently in top 10, 20, I think, in the creative awards. And so we took a lot of stuff for granted. Like we took for granted that we were gonna do good work. That strategy was going to be connected to a lot of that work, that the clients came there for good work. And when you go to different agencies around the world where none of that's true, it's quite confusing. Uh, and at the same time, on outside of all of that, very interested in mental health. I, I'm interested in the concepts of masculinity. I know, and I've talked about that and written about it, put books together book together with people about that. I know that somehow for, for, I think, bad reasons, becoming a weird taboo topic right now, it's going to do a lot of harm. Um, It's kind of getting canceled to emphasize other conversations, which are critical and vital and important. But they're like, we're going to, I'm nervous that we're going to swing the pendulum too far one way on that, on those things. Um, And yeah, now live in New York, been here for nine years, run strategy teams here, worked on, tens and tens of projects with hundreds and hundreds of well, probably hundreds and hundreds of projects, tens and tens of clients. And I uh, decided that I wanted to set up my own little thing, write books, do strategy consulting, do training. And I've done it in probably 20 to 30 cities around the world in the past two years. Great. <laughs> I've noticed actually just get, uh, checking through your LinkedIn that you removed, I'm, I'm imagining you removed all the previous experience and uh, everything that you're not doing now, basically. All the stuff from the past seems to be off of there. Yeah, I took out all the jobs. I cleaned up a lot of my internet uh, just ar- around New Year's, and I decided that I'm about now in the future. If I'm going to do life's work, then what do they call it? Cut the rope. Throw, uh, what's it, you scuttle your ships? No, there's more like some old business thing. It's probably from Confucius. Uh, basically, I don't know, cut the bridge off or something. Like burning the bridges or something? I don't know what it is. I mean, I think I get what you're talking about. Just like. Well, look, I have the opportunity now to ask myself, how do I want to spend my, how do I want to spend my days? My constraints are I'm currently in New York. I have a family to feed and, and I do really find the strategy discussion interesting because I see it as a gateway to get into helping people express themselves and to live bigger lives than just a job while also helping, maybe helping is not the right word, but also helping them have good, decent, good jobs and careers. And I was like, well, who cares about the past then? So I just deleted it all. It was just bag- baggage. Yeah. Get rid of the baggage. Awesome. Um, and do you tend to work? So I don't know if there's a, a what tends to be the mix between cause some of the stuff I've read from your website and from your training seems to be you work sometimes with individuals or groups or it tends to be mostly groups or. Yeah. Look, I haven't done a lot of direct selling or outbound. So the first year, I'd say 80% of it was doing brand strategy work. And then the sec- second year became a lot more talks and training. And I like, and, and I usually try to do both. So if I'm doing, if I'm doing some kind of brand or campaign strategy where I'm doing research, writing strategy, I call them stories, presentations, uh, what I find interesting is to also do some of the training, uh, like what's an idea, what's an insight, let's get on the same page with what those things are. So it's, it's an interesting mix. I think the USA, because it's so big. I could probably specialize. Like one of the things I didn't know I was going to be doing was helping CEOs create presentations uh, based on the research and strategy that we did. You know, I'm spending weeks, a couple of weeks interviewing well, them, their teams and their customers, and then writing a strategy, strategy for 
how they're going to exist in the world to then take their words and help them get to a presentation that they're going to take to wherever. I found it really intimate and interesting. And I love that kind of work. I've written taglines, manifestos, you know, I love, I love words. And so now that I do my own thing, I tend to attract people who are open to taking some kind of risk, who are interested in words and silly drawings, who are interested in learning. And then we just work out how to do those things on projects. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still kind of discovering exactly what it is emotionally and psychologically. I think I know what it is, but the actual activities I'm, I'm exploring and flexible. Perfect. I mean, they, I mean, perfect. I say this is perfect because I'm like, wow, you're just talking about all the different topics I put notes about that I wanted to talk about. Uh, some of them being the words and the doodles and, and drawing, uh, because words, I think is from what I understand is, is a central part to the book you're writing at the moment. It is. Yeah. It's called strategy is your words. Uh, I'm into like the fourth draft of it. I should have it out. I'll pro I'm probably going to time it for autumn 2019. I, I think I could rush it out before summer. I might, if I have, <laughs> if I just have this like hit of something, uh, then I might, I might get it out, but it's called strategy is your words. And there are about five parts to it. The two main parts are dealing with about 24 words that I hear people who do strategy work use all the time. Truth, meaning, clarity, lone wolf, I think that's two words, uh, imposter, imposter syndrome, and, and writing about my philosophy on those words from the front line. Like you're, you're in this meeting, this happens. Why are you using that word? What's the benefit of using that word? What if there's another way to look at that word? Is there a better word to use? And just trying to break it down so that it's, I guess, practical philosophy and also a bit absurdist. And then the other chunk of the book is the go-to techniques that I use to do strategy, which are from this session that I love to do called strategy, the workout, you know, the, what I, is, which is which, the challenge of that two hour session is what can I teach people about strategy in two hours that are going to be the most useful things based on my personal experience. And it's not dogmatic, but it's like, here are all the tools and I run them through things like problem, lateral thinking, problem identification, insights, how to write them, what they are, what they're not, uh, identifying a company's competitive advantage and then strategy statements or single-minded propositions and it's just all the little techniques and it, it's it's fun and cheeky and i wanted to put it into a book uh and yeah so that's that's what that book is cool that's very cool i i, I one of the terms because uh, i read the list and i did read one bit because you sent me the bit about clarity uh, but i haven't read, read the latest draft that you sent over but the um Lone wolf is a word I don't think I've ever heard around strategy, or at least not not that I remember right now. Is it, so that's something you heard quite a lot. Yeah, there are yeah a lot of people identify as either lone wolves as individuals who work in companies, or they see themselves as the only strategist in an agency or in a company, and so they will refer to themselves as a lone wolf. Got it. Okay, the explanation makes sense. It was just like it's interesting because I hadn't heard. heard you heard the terms being used in that environment very much myself. Well, it's like, maybe it's just the people I met. Yeah. I mean, it, there are these phrases that often pop up through Ted talks or books, grit, grit, resilience, imposter syndrome. And sometimes they're really, yeah. And sometimes they I find them really easy to either identify. Well, here's a risk with these words. We over identify with them. We find them too easy to identify with. We don't explore them at a subjective level. Like what do these words mean to me? What's my version of resilience? A lot of people grow up with some, like a lot of difficulties. The fact that they're still here thinking about them trying to live, that is a form of resilience. Now, if you compare yourself to that crazy set of people who are posting productivity tips on LinkedIn about getting up at 5 a.m., taking a shower, meditating for 10 and a half hours, and then working for 25 hours and then da, 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 da. It's not life for lack. It's not a useful comparison. Uh, imposter syndrome. It's very easy to identify with. So you've got to investigate what these things are, where they came from, the history of them. Ask, ask yourself, who, does, who do those words serve? A lot of these words are new-ish or they change meaning over time. Why? Which meaning do I want? Which meaning is useful to me? So that's what I'm kind of riffing with with some of these words. Very cool. And I think in the workout, you use a lot of drawings as well, the doodling? Yeah, or... it's 99.9% .9 hand-drawn. Yes. <laughs> and the drawing, where did that come? Was that something that you already did before you started like designing those workshops? Or Well, I when, when I worked in agencies, I would often be the guy drawing on walls. I have written and drawn since I was a young age. And by drawing, I mean drawing words. <laughs> so drawing my writing. I would, I would run workshops, so I'm doing it there. Uh, 
when I had little ideas or was writing insights, I would hand draw them and take them around to a creative team to, set, to get them to, you know, what, what do you think about this? Because I think by the time people have typed, typing is a valid way to explore how you think. But by the time you've typed it into a template and you're taking it around an agency to get people to look at it, you're not really looking for anything other than approval. And so I felt that at a youngish age and decided that I wanted to take unfinished thinking that was still accountable for itself with the hope of taking around the agency to get people to add to it, to change it. And so I sort of saw myself as a channel. I didn't need to be the end point to be right or wrong. Uh, that's, that's kind of how I feel. And so, and then when was it? Maybe 2009, 2010, I, I added a couple of drawings to my website. And one, one was for this post, uh, called how to do account planning a simple approach. I just sat down one day and drew out how I like to work, where I was trying to combine what I was newly understanding about brand strategy to how I did understand experience planning or the user experience. Drew it, uh, that article, a lot of the stuff that I wrote is not very well written. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing. I think I'm getting better at writing, uh, but th this thing's been read by like a hundred thousand people. And and then I had a couple of clients in my first year doing my own thing who would watch me draw as I talk to them. So I might take notes as they're talking or draw a quick diagram. And I just had a couple say, hey, you should do more of that stuff on the internet. And so I did a bit more on the internet. And the first year was pretty weird and janky and not very polished. And then as I did it, I had friends who I really respect who are almost full-time artists. And they would just send me these little messages like, keep going, keep going. And so I kept going. And then I started to started to find my voice in a stronger way. It's weird how, you know, I'm not young. It took me a while. And now I'm just unabashed and unashamed. And I'm like, that's who I am. That's how I like to communicate with the world. So short question, long answer. <laughs> no, this is great. It's perfect. Those are, that's the way I like it. <laughs> um, I was wondering, because th this is very cool. That you, so did you find you had to, and I'm asking this, this is really coming from my personal view on it, because I don't feel like I'm very good at uh well drawing because i lack practice but i also don't naturally tend to be necessarily the person standing up i would stand up in in a room and in a meeting and talk but not necessarily put everything on the board or write it or uh write and visualize like doodle what we're talking about necessarily i feel more comfortable talking about it and then going to my computer and laying it out and writing it down I guess, like, did you find you had to force yourself in the beginning or did it kind of come kind of naturally? No, to no, draw? the drawing and the writing, it's how I absorb the world. So when I do interviews, uh, so like a, an average short-term brand strategy project, I will interview a CEO for two to three hours on the phone. I'll interview four or five of their staff, employees or team for usually for about 45 minutes or so and maybe 10 to 20 of their customers. I type it all as I go. I don't record it. I tell them I'm not recording it. Sometimes that can pe put people off if they know that their words are going to be out there. I say I am typing it up, and I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm making this up in my head, but I feel the words. Like It's, it's like I've, when we're in a conversation and I hear a phrase that I haven't heard before, words that I haven't heard before, or I'm typing it, there's a, a visceral reaction that I have. And there is research about the power of handwriting and how it connects to the brain and, you know, gratitude writing by hand versus typing. Um, I don't know it well enough to be able to cite what it actually is, but I think it's a way to deal with some of the sort of social public anxiety that is definitely within me. I don't like being in big groups. Uh, I, maybe I had many years that I, maybe I spent too many years in fight or flight as a teenager. Uh, and so, and, and also there's a bit of introversion and a brain that's, that's kind of pr quite restless and thinking through things a lot. And so, you know, uh, uh, constantly looking for patterns and looking for words and it's sometimes difficult to turn off. So I did not find it difficult to write. Uh, the hardest thing I found is to really, and this is as someone who wrote a weekly column for five years, I've written for like 60 or 70 magazines in my twenties. I published a magazine on and off for 10 years. Not, it wasn't that frequent. I didn't even identify as a writer until recently. And now I'm like, you know what? I am a writer. Words are my love language out of those five love languages. And, and increasingly, I'm trying to identify as an artist. And I can define what these words mean. These, these uh, Identifying like this, I just didn't feel it was available to me growing up, even though I made a magazine. It's so bizarre.
So that I found, I found that leap, the, the that was like me maturing. And that's in the past couple of years. So the, the, so just, just to be clear, the five love languages, the words of affirmation are your number, like your top number one out of the yeah, test. Giving and taking, I would say. Yeah. Interesting. Um, mine's quality time. Yeah. I like that. So how does that come through? What's an example of quality time? I spend time on the phone with my best friends, my family, and I, I move around and go spend time with them. Um, that's, yeah. And I, if I organize anything, it's just going to be based on doing an activity together. Uh, it doesn't have to be an activity as long as it's quality time mm-hmm. together Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the people I love. I, love. I, I yearn for that. There's sometimes complexities in families and in friendship group. I, I yearn for that, but the words, I can't deny that. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I, on a Saturday night, if I'm sitting there editing a podcast at 11 p.m., there are many reasons for it, but it's just the words, it's that conversation. And if I have known people for a long time and they can't interact with the way that I think or the ideas that I have or that I'm interested in, that I find it, it's not hurtful, it kind of is. Uh, or if they don't, yeah, I actually do, I find it hurtful. So it's definitely words for me and maybe, maybe touch, but not necessarily like affectionate touch, not necessarily sexual touch. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Um, what else was I going to ask <laughs> yeah. you? Is this too, is this too, <laughs> this is too cool. much? Personal? No, my, my second one is the physical touch too. So, but I mean, I could we'll go there. Um, I tend to like on touch, I tend to not really want to touch anybody. Even like hugging at first was weird of the culture of hugging in the States, even though I grew up kissing on the cheeks because that, that's normal to me. Um, and, uh, but if, if I, it's not that I shy away from touch, but then if I, I would touch it, if I, if you're close to me, if I, for, for me, if you're somebody that's close, then touch is like yeah. cool. And appreciate totally, totally. I guess. Like, I don't recall a lot of affection growing up. It's not, don't worry. I'm not going there. Uh, and one of the first times I met my wife, I used to have earrings and I was doing martial arts. I was probably 18 or 19. And what kind of martial art? I was doing traditional Wing Chun. I did a bit of Thai boxing and within Wing Chun. Traditional Wing Chun? I'm not sure what that is. Um, <laughs> traditional Wing Chun is a form of Kung Fu. There are two types. There's, there's modified and traditional. They have battles as all, all Kung Fu and martial arts schools do. Uh, Bruce Lee studied Wing Chun and he studied with a guy called Ip Man. There've been a lot of amazing movies made by Ip Man. Uh, yes. And my friend's uncle was a senior student to Bruce Lee. So I, I sort of trained with one of his students uh, for a long time. And, and this guy had spent 10 years doing Kyokushin Karate. He was pretty, he's a pretty tough guy, a guy called uh, Sifu Rick Spain. And, and he, I don't know how old he was at the time. He was probably my age back then. He introduced Brazilian Jiu Jitsu into uh, Wing Chun and it was, it was, it was really interesting. So, yeah, martial arts was a big, big hobby for quite a while until I messed up my body. How so? Uh, I messed up my knee. I was getting onto a story. I was getting onto a story. I messed up my knee when I was twenty-five. Either a combination of too much basketball, martial arts, and wrestling on the ground, and then we we moved apartments, and I had about uh, it must have been, I don't know maybe five to ten thousand records, as in vinyl records, and my magazines, and I used this trolley or shopping cart to push maybe. 100 yards to the elevator it was this huge warehouse and then down and 100 yards out and i did it for 18 hours or something and by the end of it my knee just gave up <laughs> so hip-hop hurt me hip-hop hurt but what i was going to say on the on the, on the touch <laughs> thing like I, yeah. I was really quite edgy and 18 or 19 my wife tells this story she i think she reached for, i had these two earrings in my left ear and she kind of reached for them and i just immediately slapped her away i was not comfortable with touch but also i was training <laughs> uh and so I was quite closed down and touch is really interesting to me because one of my favorite moments of touch was being with uh, my, my grandfather when he passed away, um, I massaged his feet. He was knocked out for four or five days in palliative care. I massaged his feet, I massaged his hands. And this story is on my mind a lot now because this is because two weeks ago, and I've started to tell some of these stories a bit. It's not that the stories are important, but it's just on my mind a lot. And so talking about them helps me get it out. Uh, about two, three weeks ago, I was with the guys. He had an epileptic fit and i found myself nursing his head because it was smashing on the ground in the walls and patting his chest which i have done a lot with my children just to help them calm over the years and i, I was just saying i got you man i got you man i got you man i just kept repeating i had no idea what to do i was like scared that i was going to get hurt yes first of all 
second that I, I was going to help hurt him. Um, but to me, I was like, I'm, this is an intimate situation. This, I don't know if it's life or death or what, but I touched, it was like the thing that came out and I'm patting a strange stranger's heart. And he, so I have these strange moments with touch. Another, oh, another funny moment. I did a talk at the Can Lion, what's it called? Can Lion Festival of Creativity five or six years ago. And uh, I, I didn't drink for three months. I was doing yoga. I felt I had a moment of joy over there, which is not a word that I would have used growing up. And I, I, it was beautiful. And on the plane on the way back, this elderly Japanese lady fell asleep on my shoulder. I took a photo of it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm in the- While she was sleeping on your yeah, shoulder? Because, because I'm like, this is beautiful. So my- Okay. No, yeah. no, sure. I was just, but what came to mind immediately was the practicality of it. It was, I was like, but what if your phone's not in the wrong pocket and you can't move that arm? I, I, I managed to do it. She was on my shoulder for 20, 30 minutes and uh, do what sweet. you need to. We're humans. It's cool. Yeah. It's very sweet. And uh, how did the epileptic fit end? Well, it, it, just a curiosity. Yeah, I mean, it lasted three or four minutes and the guy had no idea. The ambulance came. I, I lost sense of time. It felt like a long time. Um, ambulance came, you know, in New York, there's often like a series of cars that turn up, which, and I always get nervous. Like maybe he doesn't have health insurance. So maybe that is going to cost him a lot of money. But, but as he stood, so he, he was in this fit for three or four minutes, frothing on the floor. We, we got him sideways. Another gentleman helped sort of stabilize his legs. My main thing was I didn't know if holding him was going to hurt him, like if it could pull a muscle or a bone, I don't know. So I just tried to keep his head from hitting things because it hit the floor and then it hit the wall twice. I was like, holy crap, I got to get down there. Uh, just totally freaking out. I had weird dreams the, the whole week. And he, after he came out of it, we kind of got him into a chair. He lunged at us. I thought, God, he's going to attack us, or he was attacking us. He took his shoes off, and then he walked through the kitchen of the cafe trying to find the exit, but there's no exit there. And then the ambulance came, and eventually he got going, but he didn't utter a sensible word. Like, he uttered a few words, but there was, there was no sentence. So we didn't know his name. We didn't know where he was from. Uh, you know, and I'm just, I hope he's okay. Mm. Yeah. Do you, and do you have a um, like emergency response training? I do not. Yeah, I don't either. And but hearing those kinds of stories is when I think, well, I sh I should do that. But so far, it's all it's all it's only stayed on the list of like things I should do. One yeah, day. I, I've been thinking the same thing, and yeah, but there's a lot of things on that list. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> another thing. So completely, so we went on a complete tangent, but just bringing back to a point you made and talked about way some time earlier. Um, was about, and, and it just made me think. So yesterday, uh, was it yesterday? No, the day before I had a, a coffee meeting with somebody here and, um, uh, that I met actually through the sweat head community, by the way. So that's, that was cool. Uh, somebody who works in a strategy consultancy used to work for advertising agencies on the planner and strategy side of things. Um, and I, well, it doesn't matter. I was thinking, oh, I'm going to probably talk with him at some point on the podcast, but it doesn't matter. I think it's, it's interesting to talk about it with you too. Um, and he transferred over to work for like a strategy consultancy. And he was telling me that, um, that it was interesting because he usually shy, he, even though he made that transition and he found it quite difficult to work in innovation and research and, uh, helping brands figure out what kinds of new products and services they're going to be doing, designing very big, well, I don't know how big, but some research projects, uh, and doing innovation workshops, that, that type of work. And that, um, uh, because strategists in advertising agencies or the ones he's come across so far tend to be trained in working to synthesize information to the minimum amount. Uh, and like in a creative brief, for example, like going down to the creative brief, finding an insight and inspiring the creative team to come up with the ideas they do come up. And he found that actually some of them, or at least the ones he come across then uh, uh, conversely are not that great at building a whole big story and a presentation of themselves and like going back and forth it seemed like the only opportunities that strategists and planners and advertising agencies have to do that not only right but often are new business pitches because designing the new business pitch presentation is a is taking like an audience through a longer larger story and when you were just talking about earlier uh helping a ceo design a presentation for whatever purposes they have and distilling I don't know if distilling is the right word. Putting a pres anyway, I was I was interested in your experience of that point 
of like being trained to synthesize stuff, at, but then maybe not being that great at building stuff and how you're finding transitioning to do that kind of work. Because I think that it seems like you're good at building those kinds of stories because you do it in workshops, you do it in classes, and you seem to be doing that with your clients at the moment. Yeah. And, and also in my early to mid twenties, I worked on multiple projects where I would write 300 page functional specifications with o over 100 wireframes that I loved to do, even though, you know, I know designers don't always like other people doing the wireframes where I would think about the information architecture and user flows and follow things through. So the challenge with the issue that you're talking about is largely it's a cultural issue. And so it's hard to, without actually stating what the culture of that place is or what that industry is, it's hard to really give a point of view because that business world as a set of cultures and as a set of personality traits is typically more conservative, more logical. It's more about deductive logic. A led to B led to C and we can prove it and it's repeatable. Whereas to be. Just to, yeah. uh, to specify, it's not completely specific, but I think what we were talking about were larger agency network, uh, advertising agency networks. So the big agencies uh, in Chicago uh, and where, you know, the strategist tends to have a role in a very large account where they're just going through the motions from one project to the next. Right. I yeah, think. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if that helps specify. A yeah. Little bit, but. So many things to sort of pull apart in that, you know, people do what helps them survive. <laughs> they do what works in the culture. So, you know, I, I'm not that interested in writing a 100 slide deck that a management consultant would like. That's, I'm not interested in that. What I like to do is write, write, well, what people would call quote unquote narratives or stories, which information fits in. And I, I don't know if there are many management consultancies that write the types of stories that I like to write that are more, there's a three act story structure, you start with some kind of provocative problem, the data serves it as opposed to something that would resemble more of a business school assignment. And it's not to trivial, it's not to trivialize, it's just different style. If they're finding people who are senior who've, well, also the thing is like, there are definitely situations in which people who get senior, they mainly exist in the management team and then in meetings where they come and say stuff and leave and, and often with coaching and mentoring to ask them to sit down and write a hundred slide deck, maybe it's going to take some time. Does that mean that they have no value? No, that's ridiculous because the value is in the thinking and the connections and access to ideas and research, research vendors, for example, that like there are practical and intellectual benefits from people. So just to judge someone through a deck, I'm not sure how strategic that is. That's fair. Cool. And it's a, it was a pretty wide open like point. I was just interested in if you found it well you so you've been doing that throughout your career pretty much one way or another writing longer documents as well as shorter less, ones. less since i moved into that brand strategy world for sure uh, but you know when i'm writing for now if i write a presentation or social posts or whatever it is for a ceo it's to convey a story and we we're not going to use a ton of business data we're not trying to make a business case we're trying to make a an emotional case that can be supported by rational things but it's a story, story, stories about ideas. Uh, from what I understand, the, the, the management consulting world is probably, it's not the opposite of that, but the, the emphasis is different, right? Yeah. 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 And I'm still trying to understand a little bit the, what are the different universes? And, and sometimes when you look at a website of whether it's a, you know, an innovation agency or a branding agency or, or even smaller management consultancies or even the bigger ones, actually, I don't even necessarily understand. Sometimes I hear from other people and I've talked to some who work in a Deloitte or whatever, and they're like, oh, yeah, there's more spreadsheets that I just nod along going, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't actually know what these people really do. But, well, there's a, there's a good book um, called The Lords of Strategy that is a journalist covering the history of management consulting that's worth looking into. And a lot of it is about, yeah, a lot of it is about finding these frameworks. And there was a period of really aggressively trying to understand competitive behaviors, the money, the prices that they paid for things, the systems, and then using that competitive knowledge to sell to companies so that they could, everyone's trying to find a way, you know? So I, th I think that management side of that management consulting world is trying to find the way there's something that's a little bit more 
oh, I'm going to use this word, these words in a wrong way, like orthodoxy or fundamentalist about that, as opposed to the advertising world where not all of it's like this, but most of it's about inventing a way. It's really art. And then you can go, it's commercial art. It's not art, whatever. Art to me is about revealing truths that are uncomfortable and doing it often in an indirect way. Do what you want with your own definitions and your own words. Uh, so these, these, these are different forces, but the Lord's of strategy covers a lot of this in a very compelling way, more spreadsheety. Uh, and they would see, you know, and, and you talk to, talk to people who work in these com- companies who used to work in advertising, who used to be creatives. I don't know. That's a huge c- cultural gap. And those it is. Um, or it seems yeah, to be management anyway. consultancies are usually very Machiavellian. Uh, you have to control the money, very empire based, very political very connected to alumni colleges that people went to, to alumni of, of companies, the company alumni, you know, that's how that whole system works uh, up or out. If you're not good, we fire you and then you hire us at the company that we hope you get a job at. It's a very different world. Yeah. I don't think I would fit very well in that kind of universe. Is, I mean, I'm not sure I even still fit extremely well in barely in advertising agencies so, mm-hmm. or any kind of like building with desks. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <laughs> so if that's one of your creative constraints, that's a fun creative constraint to try to honor. <laughs> it is. And I, it's a very interesting question ongoingly to look at what it is I want to keep honoring versus what I need to do to, you know, make sure I keep the lights on. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you can relate to that. Well, uh, talking about creating models and uh, that, I, I've, I've recently spent uh, a little bit of time and I need to spend more time on this, but looking at like, what is my thing? What is my thing go- going to be about? And maybe just give up trying to be, a, well, being a jack of all trades, even though I'm still going to be a little bit. But anyway, and, I, and this is part of the podcast and I was just like, put some words to formalize this a little bit. So it's not changed any of my interests, but this idea of play and playful strategy. And um so, because I'm interested in play and games and I want to study and learn more about it. And I'm just interested also to talk to people about how they see that. So to begin with, how did you play when you were a kid? Like what kind of forms of play or games did you enjoy? Uh, chess, puzzle games, cards. You know, there's a lot of... Do you start, mm-hmm. start chess yeah. early? Yeah, and then I didn't play it for a long time. Uh, but my kids played a lot in New York. New York City is a great city for chess. Uh, especially in the winter because you can go somewhere warm that's not your small apartment and play chess a lot. So my kids play a lot of chess. And I, I've learned I've learned things. Well, not only have they taught me about chess, but they've taught me about strategy and life through listening to them talk about chess. Oh, really? Like what? Actually, how old are your kids? Uh, they're nearly 11, nearly 13. Yeah. And so, I mean, my one of my favorite ones was my son – when he was about 10, he beat his chess teacher, chess coach. And he's a, he's a quiet kid. He, he doesn't usually say mean stuff. And we were walking home and he, he seemed disgusted. He was like, dad, my chess coach didn't use, sorry, my, my chess coach, to, my chess coach just used tactics. And he hasn't, they haven't even had a lot of coaching over the years, but there was one at the school and he played this guy and, and beat him. And I said, what do you mean he just used tactics? No, I'd heard the word in a chess context before. But I love asking my kids when they use words that I use or think about a lot, like, what does that mean to you? And essentially what he was saying was that he, if for people who know chess, <laughs> I'll, exp- I'll, I'll explain it to you in a non-chess way in a second, but that he was basically trying to do these, like set up either quick checkmates or a fork or a skewer, you know, both of which are variations of trying to attack more than one piece or, or pin a piece rather than actually having a game plan. And through that, it helped me see the idea of tactics because we use that word a lot. I just, I've, I've got something tactical to say, which is a completely different way of using the word. But it made me see tactics as gimmicks and tricks that you can do in the short term that will hurt you in the long term without a long term plan. And I haven't looked up a definition of the word tactics, but I, I arrived to it. So that might be the definition. It might be really obviously and commonly known, but. That was one thing I learned through my kids about that, about a word that we use a lot. That's pretty cool. I didn't know the specifics of, of chess, but, um, or the terms, but I, I get the idea. I think it sounds like, and I'm just going to repeat just to understand if I'm, I've got this idea right, but it sounded like the disgust in your son's 
way of using tactics is like he was just doing cheap tricks to try to get me without any further yeah, plan. Yeah. Is that, does yeah, that sound right? And that, that would eventually make the person lose. And the, I think that, I think the thing that most people who've ever played chess would know about is the four move checkmate. So four moves. And if the person doesn't know what you're doing, you beat them. And what happens when kids learn that is they just played against everyone. And eventually they played against someone who knows what they're doing and they lose. Right. But philosophically, I loved his answer. I got him to write it down. I lost half of it, but I got him to write it down. <laughs> that is very cool. That's really cool. Uh, puzzles? What? So jigsaw puzzles or other kinds of uh, puzzles? Or like crosswords? or? Yeah, jigsaw puzzles. I did a lot of crosswords. Um, Scrabble. So the main, the main games that are, are, big, are big in our household, and we do have a lot of board games because we're nerds, I would say chess is probably the game we play most or have played most. Uh, I love Blockus which is like a these Tetris shapes that you lay on a board and you have to, there's four, up to four people playing and you have to get rid of as many of your pieces as possible. You take turns and your piece uh, has to diagonally touch one of your own pieces. And that's a super fun game. Play a lot of Scrabble or Words with Friends. And then I play Clash Royale on my phone nearly every day. Is because I haven't played it, but I'm sure I've seen ads for it. That's a kind of build your village and attack other villages. It's a variation of that. So it comes from Clash of Clans, which is what you're talking about. But Clash Royale, like, um, I guess in a way like soccer and like sort of like chess, are tower defense games. Maybe not like chess. Oh, yes. Okay. So, yeah, you build your towers and you have like waves of attackers that come out. Yeah, something like like that, that, right? Ish. Okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> okay. Got it. Cool. That's interesting. That's very cool. And uh, so, and as a child, did you play those kinds of games like uh, chess? I was going to say competitively. I don't know, like coaching and playing with other people, like your children do, or yeah. But everything they're doing in America is just at a whole other level. Like, so I competed. I competed at chess. I got a, even no idea if I had a rating. I won some tournaments, and then I played on the school chess team for a couple of years. But, you know, like my kids, there's an amazing place in New York called the Marshall Club, and it's been around for, over, I think, over 100 years or 100, around 100 years. And it's basically the top, historically, like historically, the top chess people in the world. If they come to New York, they go there. Uh, and so like, on a weekend, uh, my kids can be playing grandmasters and masters and future masters. Uh, and sometimes they're competitive, actually, but it's, it's difficult. So that's a whole different world. You know, Australia might have only had a handful of grandmasters in the entire country when I was growing up. But I did, I did enjoy it. I had, a, I had a very cheap, simple chess computer and played that a lot. It made funny noises and would turn off halfway through a game. It was secondhand. But I, I enjoyed it. My grandfather had chess electronic. My grandfather's a very good chess player, but I never picked it up much. I, I learned to play as a kid, and I don't even know as much as your children do at all. They would beat me probably with a four move. <laughs> it's it's a good game. There are interesting characters. There's a there's a, an interesting subculture there. I mean, we've played. I started playing a year or two after they got into it, and I got into it. Just it was kind of fun to do it together. Uh, and you know, they've played in all over the place: New York, San Diego, Chicago. My daughter likes to play. Chicago has a big all female tournament every year. So, oh, that's interesting because I was going to ask about diversity in in the chess environment because I was reading about diversity in other types of gaming environment, which is not like you know not high, <laughs> let's say. But there's people that are vocalizing and working towards having more representation, particularly women. But uh, just yeah, all sorts. they have committees in the U.S. Chess uh, organization. Is it U.S. Chess? Yeah, U.S. Chess Federation and. I th- we see a lot of these characters around and uh, so there's a big tournament in Chicago. I don't know what the numbers are somewhere between 500 and a thousand people come in for this. America does these events so well and conferences. There's so many people out there. They come in together. It's, it's incredible. And then, you know, sometimes there are interesting things. So Nashville also has a massive tournament. Well, every year and then every four years, I think they, it's called like a super tournament. It's got the word super in it. And so sometimes you get like 4,000. I'm going to say, I'm going to make it up. I'm going to say 4,000 kids. It's probably not that many. And last time we were out there, they had a special room for girls. Uh, but from memory, it had like pampering and massage and stuff. And we all looked at each other and we're like, I don't, is this the version of femininity that we're like, what? <laughs> uh, because there is a point at which a lot of girls do get kind of bullied by their friends. Oh, you play chess? That's nerdy. And also there are some pretty, uh, oh, pretty unusual 
male characters around the game. Uh, I'm not judging, you know, but we... I, I grew up playing role-playing games. I'm a total nerd. And, the you know, I went to Gen Con last year. So there's a lot of interesting characters around miniatures play and card games and role-playing games and board yeah. games. So, like, probably like chess. I, I'm I, get a, I get a feeling my daughter would talk more honestly about it. And sometimes some of the people say some pretty crappy stuff too. Uh, some of the older men just, I don't know, they can't control what they say and some weird stuff comes out. But it's a really good community in general. And... Chess in America is really important. Now everyone's looking for that edge. How do you get into college? How do you stand out? And so there's different kind of pressure here than I think in many other countries around that game because for some reason that game has a sense of status in academia. Yeah, it does. It's it's a yeah. Not sure what's up there. All right, cool. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I was going to say I think you might have. Let me see. You might have answered that, but. I was wondering your drive to, so you keep creating models and sharing it and thinking about the industry and strategy. And I've talked about this and and I've heard you say this. So I think that's a large part about getting better by uh, making an effort to look at how you'd be teaching that. And actually I, I want to steal some of that too, but I don't know if there's anything else for you about what drives you to keep sharing it. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and like I've I've read enough <laughs> psychology and science and critiques of whatever it is that I'm doing, not me personally, but in general, to understand that these things operate in many, many, many different ways. I've done research into the behavioral economics of altruism, why people do good. There's always extrinsic and intrinsic reasons. There are reasons that you know, trying to establish yourself in in a social circle, trying to get friends. I, I, a lot of why I communicate is because I have to. A lot of it comes from a need of trying to find some kind of love and affection. I know that. Um, that's not an original thought. These, these ideas have been out there. Like, why, why do people write to find love? You know, and so what I find funny is every now and then some troll will pop up on the internet and, and say some stuff about some people I know, how they either love the sound of their own voice or they just need attention. Yes, they do. And the people who are doing the most kind of communication often they're not that stable. So the person who's sitting in their comfortable, anonymous Twitter handle who's criticizing them and feels resentment that they're not as successful as that person, that they haven't created or contributed, who set up an anonymous handle to have the only contribution of taking people down, the person that they're taking down, very, very often, their mental health isn't always that good. And one of the ways they deal with that is by communicating in public. If these people had their social and intellectual needs, net, needs met throughout their life in a stable way, do you think they're going to be on the internet talking about this stuff all the time? That's a huge generalization, but I believe it's true enough to, to deserve some kind of sweeping statement like that. So I do. And I, I, was, I was just, I mean, I know it's, it's what you meant in the sentence, but certainly criticizing by trolling and just like, you know, just being mean is not a contribution at all. It's just. I don't really follow either. I'm like, why are you spending your time doing that? You don't have anything better to do with yeah. your time? Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, so even just watch TV, just do something passive yeah. rather than just yeah. being aggressive or, or online. Edit a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, yeah, but so there are so many reasons psychologically. You know, I've met a lot of people, which I love. Um, you know, not, not really like a, a networker in a group. You know, I don't like jockeying <clears throat> for attention. Uh, in large groups, I get a little bit anxious. And so a lot of the things that I do, writing, talking, podcasting, they allow me to have intimate conversations, which are the only conversations that I'm really interested in. Uh, I can't do small talk. I, I'm sorry. I just, I mean, maybe I can, but I, I, I just like to have these deep, dark conversations and they're beautiful. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, it's, it's some form of addi addiction and OCD, no doubt. <laughs> perhaps i mean i didn't mean to i know you joke i think you were joking earlier about like me psychoanalyzing you i never know where to put the accents in certain words um i don't think I, I don't know that i'm doing that it was funny do you think i'm doing that well i think i was doing it to myself just then big w you were yeah it was just anyway well sort of 
Um, oh, this is the other question I wanted to ask you. So you were talking about how, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to manage the amount of stuff going on in your head. Do you meditate or any form of something like yeah, that? Yeah, I've had phases of it. So most days I do intermittent fasting, which to me is, is kind of like a form of meditation. And I, you know, so which is basically trying to eat within an eight hour window, uh, so that the body can do what it needs to do. Ton of interesting science about it. Um, meditation I've done in, I have, I have phases, same with yoga. I loved powerlifting. And then I, I, got, I was doing that in America. I, I got the strongest I'd ever been about five years ago. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to get back into martial arts. So my kids were doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So I took up Brazilian jiu-jitsu, messed up my thumb, was beating myself up for meeting these really expensive classes because it's expensive in New York. I was traveling for work. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> what can I do that's like just simple? So I started to get into yoga and uh, – it's available to me, which is one of those beautiful fra phrases that I understand better now. When I was younger, my nose would have been turned up at that as not being cool and whatever. It's all fluffy and hippie. I get it a little bit better now. Um, but I do, I do close down during winter. And so I've just started to do my long walks. I do these Central Park walks and I've done two of those in the past week. I think yesterday I did about 12 miles. Um, and so, yeah, and, and they're a form of meditation for me. And I listen, I listen to things and I often will write things as I'm walking. So it's, I'm okay with me not doing any of that, just being in the trees, but also it's quite productive. I'll come back. Like if I've done, if I've interviewed 20 people in, in a week, which I've done on the phone for an hour, wow, it's intense, intense, right? And I've typed it all up, uh, as I've done it, going for a walk, doing yoga, man, everything comes together at least in a way that I think is useful. It doesn't have to be right or wrong, but things always come together. So I trust myself in the, in doing this now and don't have to always be working. Sometimes walk is the work I need to do or yoga is the work I need to do. Yeah. Wait, so just one small point. You type it all up. Do you type while you're speaking to people or you transcribe the whole thing or you type all your thoughts about it? I type it all up or? as I go. I go. I'm pretty quick with that. I spend a lot of time on internet real age. So this is me being impressed. <laughs> uh, if I was impressed, I wouldn't even say that. Uh, no, I spent a lot of time on internet relay chat as a teenager. I was coding back then, I made a magazine, you know, I've, I've done a lot of typing and so I'm relatively quick. You know, I could most, I would say most, the, the average speed of a conversation I can keep up with. And if I'm not, I just say one second, I just need to finish that. And I, I try to get it verbatim. And I, I don't know what it is. I need to feel it. I need to feel the words. Sorry. It's weird. No, no, no. It's fine. It's, it's like, I think we all, each one has their own way of feeling the words. Uh, and I could relate, by the way, when you were talking about feeling words in a lot of different ways, I probably express or feel it differently. But I, I, I anyway, it resonated with me, I guess, is, is a, the word, the word of the moment to talk about that kind of thing. I think yeah. And, and I think maturity for me moving into the second half of life which is a spiritual movement, not an age movement, is just doing a slightly better job of listening to myself, seeing where I come alive, seeing where my energy is, seeing the things that I think work. And then every project, which can create some mental stirring, thinking, how do I want to work on this? What, what's going to get me there? It's way easier just to take a job and to just have a process that a producer or a project manager is going to run you through, have meetings thrown in your calendar by somebody else. That's that's kind of like low that can be low ram drifting through life kind of stuff even if you also do high ram ram computer talk high ram thinking as well right whereas i'm trying to exist more high ram um uh without exhausting myself um and sometimes i have to learn on the fly like i did four talks in three days in stockholm and oslo in december and uh, I was just excited. I hadn't been there before. I got there. There was hardly any light. Everything was closed during the day when I wasn't doing my talks. So a lot of stuff was closed, like museums and galleries on Mondays, for example. And I was really excited to see all these places. A lot of the people I knew couldn't really hang out because they were working or in, in Oslo. What's up, Oslo? Everyone was like, yeah, we're really introverted. We're just going to go home now. And it was dark. And I came back and it messed with my energy for a few weeks. Like I, I just paused on writing the book. I was like, okay, how, what are we going to do to get through the next couple of weeks? knowing that it's winter. Um, and so now I'm thinking, okay, if, if I, if, and as I do those kinds of interactions again, how can I do it in a way that won't exhaust me for three or four weeks? But I had to go through it, glamorize it, maybe even glamorizing it before to then realize that midwinter dark travel doing four talks in three days 
it's it's quite involved for me. Even though, even though if you look at the hours, maybe it's not to someone. I don't know. No, but it would take a lot, and I think the 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 weather, the gray, the night does take a lot of energy as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, I think I think we could start wrapping up. Actually, uh, unless you want to talk about men, I don't know if that's something. I know it's one of the things you're interested in talking about, but I don't know if it's something that's on your mind or if there's anything that you're doing at the moment around it. Yeah, writing or, or thinking or anything. Yeah, I mean, I, look, if I the behavior that I've got right now, if I look at that, is. I, by the way, sorry, I didn't want to. I, I was wondering if that sounded dismissive. I didn't want to mean. That was sounded dismissive. I know that that's topics that you've talked about before. And for everybody listening, there's, uh, Mark's talked about in like a few different videos that I can talk, that I will link to as well. So it's, it's a topic you've talked about before. So that's why I was just, uh, making sure that, I don't know. Anyway, I'm self nah. <laughs> it's, it's becoming, it's increasingly become a difficult topic to get into, which I think is unfortunate especially having a son, but you know what? Also having a daughter and having a wife and having grown up with a single mom. We do need to reprioritize the way that we see the world. We do need more equity. We do need less predatory behavior. Uh, I, I co-sign totally. Um, I just get nervous that we're going to turn off some of the positive, constructive talk around men. And then what I found, what I'm a bit anxious about is that as soon as you start to talk about that, you can only be, sometimes you're only a topic or two away or an idea or two away from what I guess has become known as the men's rights movement, which is quite, for some people, quite aggressive towards women. And I just hope that we can have conversations about gender, whether it's a real thing, whether it's not, the ideas of it that allow for nuance and don't immediately become extreme on both ends because that will hurt the majority of people who are not on both ends. That's, that's, that's about as much as I've thought about it right now. Uh, I'm trying to. Yeah. And I absolutely agree. I think to keep an open dialogue about everything, including those kinds of things that are, sorry. No, I, I was going to say is like, I'm trying to demonstrate it in what I'm doing with who I interview and how I interview people and, you know, I'm aware that everything I've written about the topic or talked about the topic or, you know, someone can analyze anyone's body of work and pull them apart. You know, if, when I'm interviewing someone who identifies as a woman, do I ask them tougher questions, more intimate questions? You know, what's going on there? I'm totally aware of all that stuff. It doesn't mean I can fix it in the moment or even that I know what I'm doing in the moment or after. Uh, and so that's why it's also, you know, I've read great books that have had male, um, strong male characters. And then I'll often go and read someone who's studied gender studies and read a takedown of it just so that I understand the different points of view. And I find that interesting. I, I try to keep these things alive. I don't talk directly about the topics a lot. I, I, I kind of keep a little bit distant and do it through strategy and then through the self, the self and the individual. Uh, but they're, they're important topics. I don't know. Cool. Did you did you ever write or get involved with like uh, the Good Men Project, for example, or other type of? Uh, yeah, I, I never wrote for them, but I'm pre I used to be. In, I was in contact with the, I think the gentleman who founded that was was it ten to twelve years ago. Whenever we we did a few posts about man and manhood, and I interacted with him then before it was as big as it is now. Yeah, I have a friend of mine in London. Well, actually, more than one, but one friend, and they're both called James. Actually, interestingly, but whatever. Um, who has written quite a few posts and he's his particular thing. I mean, he's interested in manhood. He's organized meetings and, and keeping that kind of conversation. I think the same kind of that you're talking about and I think is interesting too. It's just, and his particular one is, uh, male infertility. Uh, and he, cause he had, to, he's had to deal with that. And he, as he was looking through it, found that there was like precious little nothing in terms of resources, forums, groups online or anywhere to talk about it. Um, and, uh, so that's one of the things he, he actually got on TV with his wife in the UK to talk about infertility and how men deal with those kinds of issues too. And there's a lot of support for women, women for women, which is great. Um, but very little for men. And so, so I mean, that's a subset of, of this particular topic. Yeah, and I think under some of this is, is the idea or the question, you know, how can, how can we be more for each other and less against each other? The problem is there are extreme thinkers in every single topic and theme, and you can 
get into something with the best intentions and all of a sudden, for example, on YouTube, all of a sudden YouTube is showing you all these really extreme versions of the thing you were thinking about and you're sitting there going, oh, is that what I, th- am I that person? Oh my God, I'm not that person. So it's, it's hard, you know, how can, you, how, can we be more, how can we be more for each other than against each other? However, extreme is going to be difficult. Uh. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because we also say, I mean, I've heard this kind of design thinking idea from designers and strategists and, and creativity that a lot of the original ideas or new ideas or innovation comes from the extremes of thinking of areas. It might, you know, like industrial design or creating new objects might come from looking at the small percentage of people who might have a, uh, either a disability or a condition that, you know, makes it that you have to make an object in a certain particular way for them to use it, that then becomes the form factor that's going to be differentiating and have yeah. a competitive edge, advantage. Edge cases, edge cases and extremes are totally valuable f- for how we think the, the problem is when the edge cases are extremes of people doing violence at each other. <laughs> so I agree, I agree with part of the metaphor. Just uh, when, a, when a, when a, when a piece of furniture attacks you, <laughs> that, you, you gotta, you gotta draw the line there. Willem. Yes, that is okay. Well, I'll, I'll be, I'll pay attention to that next time. There's a piece of furniture that attacks me. If I fall inside my couch or something. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, let's wrap down. I have uh, some new cool down. I finished the year podcast with the cool down questions. I've just typed up some new ones, so I'm testing. So you like the last few conversations I've had are still being tested. I don't know there, there's a couple that are easy. So I mean, the easy one is: like, do you have a favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, probably go with something to do with chocolate and peanut butter, and maybe a honey thing. I don't have a specific one right now, but you know, something dark and. Chocolate mm. peanut butter is a good theme. It's strong, it works. Uh, is there? Well, we talked about chess, but uh, and there might be that. But is there a game you enjoy and recommend others playing? Well, if people haven't heard of Blockus and they like puzzles that they can play with other people, that's pretty fun. Yeah, and it's with a K, right? B L O K U S. Yes. Is there a C in front of the K? It's it's probably the way you spelt it. Yeah. I think so, uh, I don't know. Like, like many other people, right. a lot of our cardboard, the storage the containers that hold all the puzzles are a bit messed up. Uh, that hold all the games are a bit messed up. But yeah, Blockus is fun. It's good. They're, mm. they're being used. That's good. Um, what's the last piece of art or media that had an impact on you that you'd like to share? Hmm. You know, I, there's two things that come to mind, but they're the YouTube things. There's the Academy of Ideas on YouTube, which is this channel that breaks down philosophy and psychology through the ages in a really interesting way. And then sometimes I just watch like weird history things. You know, I was watching something about the migration through the Slavic of the Slavic tribes (laughs) at mid at midnight the other night. So that had an effect. Is that just you caught it on TV or on YouTube? Like, did you search for a particular channel or thing about history, or is it? Just I'm very like interested browsing? in history and the movement of people and where people come from. And I think part of that's just because growing up in Australia, even though I think one part of my family did some kind of family tree, I just don't have a lot of history. You know, my dad, my dad's from England. I don't know anybody in England through my dad, which is a kind of a weird thing. Um, and so, yeah movement of people history ideas where they all come from is 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 the thing that i love um barbara is it barbara haywood has some beautiful design in 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 london oh is that her name uh anyway there was some beautiful art that i saw in london a couple of years ago uh okay i'll make sure that we have the right name in the show notes and i'll interject with the right name if i need to uh thank you that's awesome. And I didn't know about the Academ- Academy of Ideas. So that's one I need to check out. I don't think I've come across that. Um, what's something everyone should experience at least once? Self-love. Good. And uh, this is a kind of related, but not exactly the same. I'm still figuring out if I want to split it up. I'm, I'm trying it out as two questions for now. And if you could give one thing to everyone, like you make a wish and everyone has it, what would that be? Self-love. <laughs> that's good all right do you think those two are too similar i'm wondering <laughs> it probably depends on the the head of the person you're interviewing that is true that is true but yours your two responses were very consistent like that so that's cool all right uh, well thank you this was a really fun conversation thank you and so much mark so 
I'm, I'm believing that a lot of people will know where to find you, but just in case, just let's make sure that people know where to find you and what well, to look out at for. Mark Pollard on Twitter and Instagram. And if you ever want to DM or chat about things that are going on, don't make it too weird, but I, I try to be available and talk about things. I know a lot of us don't have other people that we can have those kinds of conversations with. I try to try to be around uh, if that, uh, maybe that's an arrogant thing, but I don't know. Uh, and then markpollard.net, mightyjungle.co, Sweathead on Facebook and podcast, iTunes, Spotify, all those places. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Join, like, check out the podcast, join the group on Facebook. There's a lot of people talking with each other. Are you going to be uh, traveling, doing events or workshops, talks or anything um, like that soon? Or? I mean, I'm definitely doing a talk at a conference called Zmelt in India in Mumbai in May. And yeah, it's going to be oh, that's big. exciting. I think it's going to be really big. And then Julian Cole and I are, we're planning something. We're looking at 14th of June, him and I for a day in New York. And when I get my book done, then I'll plan some of my own public things. So I'm, I'm about a month away from having the book done. And then I've got to work out how to get it out into the world. So there'll be, there'll be more stuff coming. I, I love it. So fun. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Mark. Peace. Thank you. All right. That's another episode wrapping up. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you just already like subscribing to the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. And ideally, please share it with your friend. It makes a hell of a difference if you just post it on your Facebook or post it on Twitter. Tell another friend to listen to it. Post it on LinkedIn. I just want more people to listen to this, right? And uh, as I said at the beginning, if you're interested in uh, being on the show, just reach out to me. My email is uh, villem, W-I-L-L-E-M, at icecreamforeveryone.net. Or uh, you can find the contact forms on the website at icecreamforeveryone.net or get in touch via Facebook, Twitter, however you want to get in touch. I looked at, I look at all the channels. LinkedIn, you know, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, just look up my name, Willem Vanderhorst. And uh, I think that's about it for now. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review. That makes the most difference to the engines that are distributing and dishing out podcasts to people because, of course, there's a lot of different podcasts to listen to. And in that sense or uh, regard... To that point, rather, thank you. Basically, thank you for listening. There's tons of other podcasts to listen to. So thank you for listening to this particular episode, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, thanks. Bye. <music>